welcome to um, yeah, our Q&A on Monolith to Microservices um, with Sam Newman, the author of the book Monolith to Microservices and also um, yeah, the author of the very first microservices book. So uh, welcome, uh, Sam, and Thank many thanks for joining the session. Uh, how does this session look like? It is a Q&A, you know, 40 minutes about uh, Sam's new book. And the book has five chapters. I want to discuss with him uh, when to move to microservices and when not taking people on the journey, splitting the monolith, decomposing the database, and the growing pains you get when having 10 services, 30 or 50 or even more services. And although I prepared, uh, I think, enough questions for um, 40 minutes or an hour, uh, every attendee can ask questions via, directly via Zoom or the Go-To app, and I try to incorporate them. When we want to move to, um, to microservices, the first question is, um, is that even a good idea? So, Sam, when should I move to microservices and when should I not move to microservice? When should I stick to a monolith? Okay. Um, but when should you move to microservices? Uh, when you've very, very good reason. I think that's the, that's the, the quick answer. You've got to have a really, really good reason. Uh, um, microservice architectures bring a host of challenges because, and these are the challenges sort of fundamental with being a, a, a more distributed system than potentially architectures that you're used to. And so it's very important that, you know, it's, an, it's a decision you're going into with your eyes open. And so if you're not sure if microservices are right for you, well, then maybe explore other things first. So I, it's, you've got to have a great pressing reason to, to, to move forward with. And, and normally, I, well, the way I try and structure it is to say, okay, what problem is it you've got? What, uh, what thing can't you do with your current system? What, you know, is it about scaling? Is it about having more people on the projects? Is it about shipping faster? Be really clear about that, that problem you've got and then look at all the other things you could do instead of microservices. Um, uh, because I think it's, unfortunately, microservices have become like the default approach to all systems architecture. And I think that's a dangerous decision. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we, we do, uh, the, the company I work for, we do uh, lots of architecture consulting and obviously, um, yeah, you have to understand the requirements in order to, to select an appropriate architecture. But yeah, lots of people, you know, the, the, mo the, 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 the reason, the most important reason you choose is because everyone else is doing it. And uh, that leads to lots of problems. Yeah, uh, we, we used, there used to be a, a saying, I don't know how many people remember this, uh, but that nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Exactly. It's the case that everyone would just buy IBM software, they'd buy IBM computers because everybody else did it. And so if you bought IBM, but it didn't work out for you, you couldn't be blamed because everybody else is making the same deck. Um, and I think microservices are in that same space. I remember when I was still at ThoughtWorks, uh, we put an item on the tech radar, which was called microservice envy was that you know people are saying oh they've got microservices we should microservices just as it's just a sillier thing to do as saying i'm going to do the spotify model <laughs> um I, I think you know by all means learn from what other people have done uh but but you need to adapt you know you need to understand your own situation to and decide whether those ideas work for you mm. um but you know the, the one question i i wonder is you know what what, when, when do I uh, speak about microservices? Because over the last, I have no idea, 10 years or something, it's a long time ago, I, I was working with a single application. So each application at least consisted of, let's say three parts, um, even if they had a shared database. When, when would you speak about uh, when would you say a system is a microservice system? Does it have two services or 10 or 30 or 50? Where, where is the line? Uh, so this is the, this is the problem is that, that adopting a microservice architecture, it's not like a bind off or on state. And I, and I think this is, 
it's also like when people say I've got a monolith, there are lots of different types of monolithic architecture. You know, I talk about the monolith primarily as a unit of deployment. Um, so I, I don't say you've got microservices or you don't. It's not like a switch. It's not like a, a zero or one. For me, it's much more like a dial. So when you're thinking about adopting microservices, it's like if I've got one or two services, if I've structured them around a business domain, I've ensured they're independently deployable, I've you know, encapsulated their data storage, then I've got two microservices. It's a really simple microservice architecture and likely not gonna give you much pain. As you turn that dial up and you have more services, um, you tend to potentially magnify all of the problems associated with distributed systems. And therefore that architecture is likely gonna give you more trouble Mm. On the flip side, you may well get more benefit to take advantage of those microservice architectures. And, and look, for some organizations, the right answer is two or three or four services. For some, I mean, I was chatting to um, one of the people at Monzo, who's a, which is a, a, a fintech challenger bank here in the UK. They've mm. got 1.6 million customers. They've got over, they've got now got 1,600 services. <laughs> and for them, that works really well. Mm. But if you don't know what they do or how they do that or why them and you just tried copying what they did, it could be a disaster for you. Mm -hmm. So it's more, you know, remember it's, you have that dial, you decide how far you turn that dial. Uh, and when I work with people on, you know, transition, I, you know what, let's start with that dial being really low. Mm -hmm. um, the analogy I've got is it's a bit like, um, it is like turning the dial of volume, right? So imagine your headphones not plugged in. You don't want to crank that dial, that volume dial around to 11 and then plug your headphones in because it will blow your eardrums. Mm. Instead, you put your headphones on, you slowly turn that dial up until you find your happy place. And then what you see time and time again, if you look at organization after organization after organization, if you look at those that have done a successful microservices adoption, it's not an overnight, bam, we've got thousands. They start with one or two or three. They bed those in, they get them running, they learn, and then they add some more if they want to. The vast majority of the challenges that you face with a microservice architecture are only going to be visible to you, really hit you once you're in a production environment. And so until you're in production, serving real production traffic, a lot of the problems associated with these architectures are invisible. And so it's very important that as you're turning that dial up, you're getting that feedback as to how it's working for you. You know, Monzo didn't get to 1600 services overnight, uh, nor should you. And maybe your happy place is two. Don't feel bad about that. If you're happy, your boss is happy, your users are happy, your customers are happy, your business is making money, then microservices absolutely do not matter. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a good point, you know, that you, that you mentioned the dial, because uh, I remember some time ago there was a, um, on, on Martin Fowler's website was Martin Fowler and Stefan Tilkov discussing, should you do microservices first or monolith first? And, um, you know, with all the uh, advantages and, and disadvantages to do that. And I see it quite often that uh, companies are coming and saying, you know, we do microservices because, I mean, they have probably, they have real problems, you know, they want to speed up delivery, they have hundreds of developers, which are in, you know, which are stepping on each uh, toes. But then they start up front with, you know, immediately with 20 microservices. And, um, and that brings lots of problems, not only to the, to, um, to the company, to the developers and all their problems, but to the rest of the company. So you also mentioned that on the, you know, you have a chapter in the book, um, you know, how the organization needs to change because all of a sudden we have self-contained teams, you know, you have, what are you doing with QA, with release management, with, um, uh, with operations? They are not dedicated departments anymore, but they have to, you know, they, they also have to, to unlearn what they are doing now and to learn um, you know, what, what to do next. And it's, it's probably better to do that in an incremental fashion than a, a big bang. Well, well, I think that's also speaks to, I think is sometimes we, we like 
squat, uh, conflating lots of things together. I mean, microservices are about separating these ideas. And, and yet when we talk about microservices, we end up also merging lots of ideas together. So I think that, that the thing you talked about of the poly skilled full ownership team, you know, a team that maybe owns the creation, deployment, development, support, maintenance, and ultimately retiring of a service, you know, where you've got a team with all of those roles in it, a self autonomous team. That's only one model of how a team can adopt microservices. And whether or not you want that kind of organizational structure can be an orthogonal conversation than whether or not you want microservices. I think microservices work well with those organizational models, but you don't need to do it. There are plenty of organizations out there that use microservices well, but still hand off those services to separate teams for running. Um, and so I think if your organization is deciding, should we do microservices, you don't have to also change your organizational structures at the same time. I think coming back to your point though about this incremental nature, it becomes much easier to assess how your organization could change most out of that microservice architecture if you're also adopting those microservices in an incremental fashion as well. Um, so, you know, this idea that as you're adding more services, you know, you're adding one or two or three, you will get to see where the tension points are in how you currently develop software, in how you currently organize yourself. And that allows you to, to sort of shift your organizational structure as you're shifting your architecture. Uh, so I think that those ideas can evolve together, but they don't have to evolve together. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting because I, you know, moving, I just wonder when you said, you know, uh, th there can be a dedicated operation team taking over the services or you can still have, you know, an, let's say an old fashioned release management, you know, to, to me, that sounds like you, you have, uh, you're not winning with microservices because what's the what's the point of uh, let's say have a release management if if teams cannot deploy on their own whenever they want, isn't that one of the major um, advantages of a microservice? I talk about microservices as being things that are independently deployable. I don't say that the team that writes the software. Mm. Well, have to deploy the software. Okay. okay. Those are different ideas. So who actually does that deployment is a separate activity. Mm. So for me, I totally like it. And it also comes back down to what problem you're trying to solve. So if your main concern is about scaling your application and you, you've done all the other due diligence, you've, you've tried doing horizontal partitioning of your, your, you've tried doing horizontal duplication of your existing monolithic application. You've tried sharding it. Those things aren't working. You need mm. to move towards microservice to get the scale that you need. Then that doesn't necessarily speak to a team owning and shipping and deploying that software. It doesn't have to be the same idea. We still want our architecture to be independently deployable. That just doesn't mean it could still be somebody else just doing that independent deployment. This is why I mean they're very orthogonal concepts. So for, mm -hmm. you know, if you're looking, uh, let's spin this around a different way. If your problem was time to market, I wouldn't start with a microservice architecture. I would start saying, well, what are, are the processes by which you get software into production? What are the activities that go on? You might decide that getting rid of a separate operations department might be a way of getting your software out more quickly and that you could do that without having to re-architect the application, right? Why can't the monolith be owned by one team that writes the code of the monolith and deploys that monolith? Hmm. You know, so that they are, that's what I mean by them being separate ideas. I think they work very well together, these two concepts. I think to get the most out of microservices, having a good strong alignment around ownership boundaries and the depth of ownership is important. Hmm. I certainly think a strong ownership model makes sense from a development point of view. So the develop, you know, that so you should really, in most situations, be able to trace back a service back to the team that owns it from a point of view of, you know, the code changes and ideally moving that in forwards as well into operational ownership as well would be a great thing to do. Mm. Um, but you don't, you know, you don't have to go to the nth degree. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a great way. I mean, look, you can't go into an organization. They will take a this system that's the core of your business that you've had for the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. We're going to move it to a microservice architecture. Oh, and we're fundamentally going to change how every single one of you develops software. And you people that have never actually had to be on support before, now you're on 24-7 support. Here's your pages. 
that's a great way to lose half your company overnight. Like you don't <laughs> make those changes like that, that quickly. This is an organizational shift. If you choose to make it is incremental, just as the architectural shifts are. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I am, you know, I'm laughing, but although it's not funny because I experienced that, uh, two years ago, <laughs> exactly okay. that, that approach. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if you, if you overwhelm the, the company with, especially if you do it, I would say resume driven, um, resume driven, uh, microservices, then yeah, you can lose or you will lose lots of people. Yeah. Uh, one one of the, the the concrete bits of well, one of the concrete suggestions I actually have in the second chapter talking about this shifting in ownership or, or, or changing the working practices and it can be is, is to do quite a simple exercise is to get the people in the room involved with shipping your software and to say they list out all the activities that are, that are carried out as part of shipping this piece of software so you can do the post-it notes if you want okay so there's writing the code there's you know, doing your manual exploratory testing, there's whatever it might be, you list them all out. And then you say, okay, who owns those activities today? And you might see, okay, well, the delivery team, they own kind of coming up with the code. They, they, they write the code, they do the new testing. Um, it's the operations team and do the deployments and do the first line support, second line support, the third line support goes back to the delivery team. And then what you say is, okay, well, here's all the 25 things that we do. Here's the 17 things you do. Already, that's a useful exercise in terms of collectively, we now understand where these activities and responsibilities lie. And really, you should do it based on responsibilities, not activities. Then what you can say is, okay, well, we want to make a shift. Which, which responsibilities are going to move? So we don't take on board all of the operational ownership activity. Maybe our, this development team is really ready. They're going to take on board. We're also going to do tier one, tier two support. And we're going to let that bed in for the next two months. And if that works, maybe we'll go doing tier one support as well. Hmm. And, and diff in, in a larger organization, different teams will be in different phases of readiness. Different hmm. applications okay. will have different levels of critical. So it's not going to be a one. I mean, ultimately, this is just good old fashioned change management, to be honest hmm. with you. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was at a project where we didn't do that. Um, and yeah, what, what you say, different teams are usually in different situations and you cannot, you know, some are super, um, super experienced. They do nothing else than running their own software for 10 years and others basically have no idea. And to just throw them in one basket and treat them all the same is, you know, it's, it's an invitation for failure. Um, I, I just got a question via uh, the app and that one is, Mm -hmm. It feels like all the big companies use microservices. Are there any of the big ones that go monolith instead? What advantages? I, I, I think a lot of um, I, I think a lot of this depends on what you mean by a big company. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. we could talk about the big tech companies. A good example of a big tech company, which is largely ethic, although there's always some things around the edges, would be Facebook. Uh, another one would be Salesforce. Salesforce is a market capitalization of what's somewhere north of $60 billion. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of Salesforce is built on top of a now 16 or 16 year old Java monolithic application. I think it mm -hmm. might be older than that. So there are plenty of examples of organizations which have become very successful using monolithic applications. Um, I think if you look inside most banks or bank operations for many organizations will run fundamentally on mainframes and uh, mainframe systems are by and large what we would consider to be monolithic applications although there are different deployment models available within those different platforms um, and so it depends on what you mean by um, I think what you might actually see is more the companies that talk about their systems architecture end up talking about microservice architectures because people only ask people doing in air quotes, sexy architectures as you can talk. Mm. You see extremely few talks by people that said microservices didn't work out for us or, you know, we do a monolith because everyone goes, well, really dull. <laughs> so I, I don't think it's, it, it's, that's the thing. I mean, that, it, to, there's, there's an extent to which, you know, 
we can be a bit self because we're extrapolating from the wrong data points, right? If you go to a microservices conference, guess what? Most talks about microservices. Mm -hmm. You go to a, the microservices track, they're not going to be talking about models as much. So that's, I think, part of this. Uh, the I think the other thing that's happening is a lot of organizations that maybe would have looked at architectures like microservices but were put off in the past are now starting to look at them again. Um, I mean, Salesforce as an organization, for example, I know for over the last few years has been looking to decompose their sort of more monolithic application. Um, uh, and part of that's happening because we are sharing ideas. And so it's easier for you to say, okay, well, I'm a big finance organization. I've got lots of, model, of mainframe applications. I couldn't possibly think of something like the public cloud services, putting them to somebody like Vanguard in the US who have done exactly that, have gone from a mainframe application and they're moving towards a microservice architecture running on AWS. So now as you're surrounded by more people that look a bit like your organization and have some of your challenges it, and have done these things, it becomes much easier for you to think maybe it's something I could do myself. And so I think that's really what's happening. It's just with sharing these examples to people, maybe it's for me as well. Maybe I could do that as well. Hmm. Yeah, I think especially if you, um, yeah, if you're a bit unsure and you're missing, uh, uh, the experience uh, to do that, it's always good that, you know, you hear that traditional companies um, are, you know, preparing the way. And I think in, in a few seconds, um, we, we will also, we will talk about how to break the monolith. And just what one, one comment I wanted to make, I think Etsy was one of the, I don't know if Etsy is a big tech company, but it's at least a, a a famous tech company. Uh, I think they ran for a long time a monolith and they probably still have a monolith. And they were talking about it, you know, why they have a monolith and why a monolith makes sense to them. Yeah, it's so, so um, I, I mean, part of the reason that it was a monolithic application and, and Flickr largely before that was, was monolithic as well uh, was because that, you know, Etsy makes heavy use of PHP, um, which is a very good programming it's a perfectly good programming language very productive platform for many people idiomatically php applications tend towards being more monolithic in nature um but it worked really well for them i mean um but so yeah etsy did then start introducing services around the edges one of the th i had i've had this conversation with john allsport once he would say you know oh we don't do we don't want to be uh, doing microservices because we don't want to build a distributed system the reality is mm -hmm. they're a, 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 P a sort of classical single process or in PHP application is still a distributed system. Because if, you're, if you talk to a database that lives on a different machine to where your code is running, you have a distributed system. If you put data into a browser, you have a distributed system. You have a very simple distributed system, but you still do have a distributed system. So um, they were still having to do things, even with their more monolithic architectures, just because of the extent to scale that would still be things that maybe smaller microservice organizations wouldn't have to worry about. So this comes back to this idea of the dial, even as organizations which are in air quotes monolithic can often be distributed. This also comes back to the definition of a monolith that I tend to try and use, which is a unit of deployment. Um, some of the more problematic architectures I've seen are what I refer to and other people have referred to as distributed monoliths. These are highly distributed systems nonetheless be deployed in sort of a lockstep deployment model. And this could be caused through um, sort of using things like release train deployment practices or by actually having overly coupled architectures or search management in the right way, you have this issue. Um, and so, you know, having this sort of distributed monolithic deployments, they tend to have the, the challenges of being a monolithic deployment, um, but also the challenges of being quite distributed. So even then you sort of have to be careful a bit with your, your definitions and where you draw those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I just want to, to switch to, um, to our third uh, chapter, let's say, um, you know, how to split the monolith. Um, let's assume it's possible to split the monolith. So sometimes it's just not uh, possible, but um, one, 
very popular approach, uh, which I personally love, um, you describe in the book is the Strangler application or the st Strangler pattern. Um, yeah. Could you, could you explain what that is and when I, when I should use that? So a strangler fig pattern or a strangler fig application, it's a process whereby you, you sort of wrap a new system around the old system. So it's a pattern that fundamentally helps you incrementally replatform functionality. So I've got functionality that lives in my, in our case, a monolithic architecture. I want to migrate that functionality over to you, my new microservice architecture. Now I don't want to do a whole big bang rewrite. I'd rather move that functionality incrementally. But I also want the new functionality as I've moved it to also be live. So the way you can think about it is it's, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's your type of imagine your sort of the, the, your new system, like tendrils wrapped around the old system. As a call comes into your old system, if that call is served by the new functionality, your new functionality in those call, if that functionality isn't being managed by your new implementation, it instead is allowed to pass through to the underlying system. The simplest example of how you might implement something like that would be something using a HTTP proxy. So to say, raise an invoice and the proxy redirects like that call over to the, um, our new microservice because our microservices can handle raising invoice. Another call in that there's place well, the, mi the microservices don't handle orders yet, so we allow that call to carry on to the existing monolithic application architecture. Mm. So basically, we intercept calls at the perimeter of the existing system that we're being meeting. And sort of HTTP or proxy-based interceptions are the most common uh, technique for implementing a pattern like that. Um, for the pattern to work, you need to be able to intercept calls at the perimeter of the system. So um, a calls that come into your system are what you're intercepting and diverting. Um, so if I'm saying raise, if I'm placing an order, that's a call that's coming into my application. Maybe I'm intercepting user interface, easy thing to picture. As part of in placing an order, I might also want to send an email or send a notification or give you some points to reward your loyalty. Those things might be buried away inside monolith they found as side effects i wouldn't be able to use a mon a, a, a strangler a fig application to replace those bits of functionality as easily so i'd kind of they work for things that sort of top up on your call stack uh, that are sort of uh, very much externally identifiable and interceptable mm. um and i've seen i've spoken to people that have done it with a, a variety of different technologies i've done it with um message uh, you know you can think of really well though, but I've used it for interceptors using sort of asynchronous message-based systems. Uh, I spoke to a team in Switzerland that did this with FTP. So their clients were actually uploading payloads via FTP and they actually intercepted the, the FTP things at the layer and shut out the things that they were diverting. So it's, it's actually a pattern that's uh, remarkably uh, useful and applicable in a number of situations. Hmm. Yeah, I think it has the, the big advantage that you can slowly move and, you know, it supports the, yeah, the, the incremental change. Um, I yeah. was a bit surprised, um, you know, it, I thought Strangler application is not only that you have a proxy, but um, you also, you mentioned in the book, um, UI decomposition. And I also thought that UI decomposition um, um, is also some sort of strangulation because um, you, I just take, you know, I have my, my application and then I, I, uh, I cut out some part of the UI and replace that with an end-to-end -end functionality um, of the new system, which is a Yes, that, I mean, I, I, I do actually talk about um, the, an example of UI decomposition in the context of the Strangler um, just so I talk about a project I was involved with, which was helping rebuild the Guardian website. And so the very first thing that we sent live when we rebuilt the Guardian was a, um, a travel widget. So you'd go to the travel page and the bulk travel page was rendered, was delivered by the old system, except it left a little box. And that box was actually just a widget that showed you the keywords for that article. That was served out of the new application stack. Mm. And so I 
do talk, I, I talk about decomposition in more detail, it's a separate section, but I also do talk about that as being an example of a, a sort of strangler fig uh, interception. Right, so there we're doing the interception up at the UI layer. Um, another example I've seen was um, a banking, a business banking application in Australia where um, there was a actually thick client desktop software. They were slowly moving over to a web-based interface and they were just basically hollow parts of this thing why were running as a window application. And they just started to embed web controls. And that exa again is an example of, of strangler fig application interception. But it's sort of happening. The key thing here is but in both situations, both with the UI interception or the HTTP perception, this is playing on the external perimeter of the system. Um, and typically the underlying monolithic application has no awareness that anything has changed. Um, and so, but it absolutely can work at the layer as well. Mm, okay. Um, so now let's say we, you know, we, we do our application strangulation. Um, one big problem is of course the database. So I have my, my monolithic database. Um, I need to break it down somehow. So what, what do I have to think about when it comes to, to, the, da to the database? Yeah, so I think, um, well, the, 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 the reason we want to break it down is because we, in general, don't want to share databases. So we don't want our, you know, all of our data in one place longer term because it causes coupling and all kinds of other issues. So if I've pulled the code out, I'm going to want to pull the data out. So the but well, there's almost like two ways you can look at it. If I've got a nice new microservice that needs some data, the thing you want to ask yourself, what data is it that I want? If it's actually data that should not be owned by me, so if we think about, you know, so actually maybe I'm the invoicing service, but the, the data that I want, the order relator, well, I'm not the source of truth for orders, so I should go to the source of truth for orders. And, you know, if that was, if the invoice service was the first one you extracted, it probably follows that the order data is still in the monolith, in which case you invoice service should go and ask the monolith for the data it needs, which would imply going to some kind of well-defined service interface. So then that might, that might be exposing an API. On the other hand, the data that you want might if you've got an invoicing, then, then that invoicing data is yours, right? So you've now got to go into the monolithic database and rip that data out and store it in your own, your own data store locally. Um, now that is a difficult bit because with, with the monolithic application decomposition, we're typically talking about systems that use a relational database. And relational databases are relational, which is good at level because it makes exceptions between different parts of data but our applications have come to rely on a number of characteristics that relational databases give us uh, things like referential integrity um, and fast joins and those sorts of things hmm. and so as we're pulling data out of a relational database we have to actually look at what happens when we do things like break from key relationships um, that may well result sometimes in back in our software, our software in a different way. We might introduce situations where we could now have inconsistency of data in terms from, from a structural integrity, from a referential integrity point of view. Um, and we might make joins across data much slower, which might cause us to have to look into things like caching to improve the latency of our system. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if, if I break the database, yeah, one thing is how can I stay a consistent, you know, sometimes, you know, that there must be a system which is the master. And the other thing I'm wondering is, you know, if, if I take it to the extreme, and that's what I'm currently seeing is we have 50 data, uh, 50 microservices, and we have 50 databases, you know, a database for each service. Um, wh where do I draw the line, um, you know, what should I think about in terms of breaking a database apart when it comes to scale of many microservices. So obviously in an ideal case, you know, each service has its own data store, but then, you know, having 50 data stores costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of resources. You have lots of problems with consistency. What are the questions I need to ask when, when I go to many, many services and possibly need many, many databases for each service? 
so there's there's almost there's two separate questions you've got in there really which i think we should, we'll address them separately because the one is about consistency and the other is about yeah, yeah, the sorry. operational <laughs> complexity that comes from having lots of databases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, but, which is fine. But 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 it's it's let's let's talk. I'll talk about the second one first. So what we're looking for here is that we want to have a logical isolation of our data management for a service. So but I am the invoice service. I manage with the invoice data. Nobody else outside of the invoice service perimeter has direct access to my data. That allows my invoice service for the state transitions or mutations of state uh, and it also allows you to have explicit contracts that expose how that data is accessed by external parties so we're looking here for logical isolation of data that may or may not be physical isolation what i mean by that is if you've ever kind of logged in and done anything with a database directly you know most relational databases as an example will have the concept of being able to run multiple logically isolated databases or the, the language used by where various vendor to vendor running on the same physical infrastructure. Mm. So I could run an, uh, a MySQL database on my laptop, have six or seven different databases running on that same instance of MySQL, but none of those schemas could actually talk to each other. So they're logically isolated, but they're all running on the same MySQL setup, so they're not physically isolated. And this is actually a very common model for organizations that run MySQL services on premise or on -premise cloud they will tend to have a smaller num a smaller amount of, phys of physical databases running but those database instances might have multiple logically isolated schemas running on top of them um, so we'll have a small highly available resilient you know database bits of infrastructure running this stuff for you mm -hmm. um, the issue with that of course is if i've got a database that hosts the schemas for say 10 different services if that data Base dies, I'm going to take out this microservices. So it's quite a large blast radius in terms of failure. <laughs> so you can play with those levers. Logical isolation is vital. If you've got logical isolation, you then get to decide if you want the physical isolation. On prem people tend to have a lower level of physical isolation, often because the, the ability to provision these things is quite expensive. It's expensive to provision these things, it has a cost associated mm. with it. People that I see running microservices on the public cloud are much more likely to actually provision entirely dedicated database stacks for each microservice because it, the costs are actually much easier to, to manage. Um, it's much quicker, the, you know, the, sort of the, the engineer time associated with that is much, much lower. Mm -hmm. um, and, but you get those levels, those levels are different levels. If you want to put all your logical schemas on one big database because you think you really trust that database, then great, but you better really trust that database. Um, the second thing is, um, is talking about consistency. I think you use the phrase, you want to have a master, you know, a source of truth. Those two things on, you know, that's absolutely true. When I say where is, what, what is the, what is the state of this invoice? I want to know where I go and ask that question. If I want to mutate an invoice, I want to know who I ask to mutate an invoice. And so that's not a problem. And microservices actually make that quite clear. A single monolith with all my in place is also it's clear there. There's only one source of truth for everything. Um, so my invoice service, if I want to know the current state of an invoice, my best chance of seeing an upstate view of that is going and asking the invoice service directly. Um, that doesn't change. So from that point of view of consistency, the reason I think consistency comes up is because of the other problem, which is latency. Now, ideally, whenever I want to say what state is this order in, what state is this invoice in, I go directly to that service and say, please tell me the state of that order please tell me the state of the invoice. But if I'm doing that a lot, that makes lots of network calls that can mm -hmm. increase the latency of my application. One of the ways I make the latency better is by cache data. Now, if I cache information, I may have got that, in, that invoice from the source of truth. I then choose to cache that locally to avoid constantly round tripping. My then trade-off is that I now may be seeing a, you know, that invoice record I'm looking at locally may not actually be what state it's in on the source of truth. Uh, Pat Helen does, has got a really nice article called uh, Memories, Guesses and Apologies. It says distributed systems are basically just memories, guesses and apologies. And when you get a piece of data from somebody else, what you now have is a memory. It's a memory of what that thing looked like. It may not be correct anymore. Mm. So when you try and act on it, you might find you're acting on some out of date information. Now, if you've ever read data from a read replica, on a database, 
you are basically dealing with information that may be in that may now be out of date right you're dealing with what's an eventually consistent system the way a read replica works the database is you write some data uh, that gets committed goes into the commit log once it's in the commit log behind the scenes your database is actually then doing the replication of pushing that data out to a read replica so when the data appears in the read replica that's not what the data is it's what the data was at a certain point in time it might also be what the data still is but you don't know mm. there's a, there's, and there's a window of how inconsistent can be and the, that's the wind that window is key now, if you need to have a, a full, you know, if you need to know that this data is no more than one minute old, there's a vast array of stuff. To do. If you need to know this piece of data is only one millisecond old, that's quite a different type of system to build. Mm. And so how much you can tolerate seeing slightly out of date bits of data gives you often be a, a, a very big driver in terms of how far you go in terms of breaking things apart as well. Mm. There's a different type of consistency, which is sort of referential integrity, and that's a that's a more complex issue. Um, you know, an order has a reference on a customer. The customer, or, or, or an order has a reference, say, on a on a company. The company is managed by a company service. The order is managed by an order service. What happens if the company service deletes the company record? Uh, don't know there's lots of ways we can solve that um that's not really a sort of a classic consistent that's a that's a ref that's sort of a, a referential integrity issue more than a classical consistency issue really um but there are lots of different ways you can solve that problem okay i just had a look at the at the clock um although i would like to you know dive deeper into especially the you know uh, how big is your window um, yeah, unfortunately, we, yeah, time is up. Um, yeah, uh, Sam, thank you very much for, um, for being on the, on, on the q and I think we will do a follow-up podcast, um, you know, where we possibly have more time. Um, thank you for the attendees, for asking questions, and uh, please remember to, to vote the session. <laughs>